So these are some of the images that people sent in before the event. So thank you so much for those of you who sent in your favorite pictures and artists, some really beautiful trees here. So I think what we'll do now is um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, it would be great if we could go onto gallery view so we can see who's here. Um, I'd like to see everyone's faces. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to this event about trees. Um, I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, I'm, I love trees and they've been um, really speaking to me over the last month, um, taken on a new meaning for me. So um, what I thought we'd do, first of all, is um, I'm going to read out some of the trees that you sent me that you said were your favourite trees. And I thought if that is your favourite tree, if you leave your camera on and then we can see whose trees are their favourite. So first of all, if willow is your favourite tree, keep your camera on. Agnieszka, Izzy, Julia, Joanna, Rosanna, Laura, Julia. Cool. So uh, next one is if horse ch chestnut tree is your favorite tree. Laura. Only <laughs> me. <laughs> Laura. Oh, it's because it's uh, nice memories for me. Okay. And what about... Um, Giant redwood trees. Ah, uh, oh, two. Constance and Naveed. And what about apple trees? Who likes apple trees? That was me. <laughs> I've got one in my garden, a tiny one. Nice. Uh, let's see, what about oak tree? Who likes oaks? Anna, Anieszka, Samantha. <laughs> cool. And what about other trees that I haven't mentioned? You can take yourself off mute now. Um, if I haven't mentioned your favourite tree, give me a wave and let me know what it is. Jenny, what's your favourite tree? You're on mute, by the way. Oh, sorry, here I am. Um, I put curtain fig tree because I come across one in Australia and it was just this enormous kind of tree that, that like sucks the life out of another tree and made this huge sort of cavern that you could walk in. So it was really rare and I really loved it. Nice. Who else would like to share their tree? Hi. <laughs> uh, can you Constance. hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, no, I really like mangrove trees. Not, not, yeah. not, not specifically because of aesthetics, but just how fascinating they are um, in terms of like regulating ecosystem services and all that. Like I just find them really complex, interesting habitats. Um, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, Mahesh? Well, uh, I like baobab because they are very different to look at than other trees. They are massive and really, really wonderful. And they are very useful as well for people who live around those trees. Ah, you have, I do I have, I, from West oh, Africa. I, said, I said bring mine as well. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Anyone else would like to share? I really love maple trees. We had a huge maple tree outside of my house in the states growing up and it would go so bright and orange in the autumn and I loved that change in, in season. Paul? Hello yeah I, I went for a, a podocarpus tree which is, is a, a great big tall conifer tree that uh, is, is native to, to many parts of Africa and we planted one about 30 years ago in, in our garden in Kenya and it, it, it's very tall and this family of bush babies has taken up residence in that tree and so we can hear them at night making strange noises lovely talking to each other yeah any more for any more any favorite trees people would like to share oh, cool it's really great to see all of you um so just a few things before we kick off um first of all welcome this is um, the event about trees, and we're going to learn all about trees. Um, so just to let you know that if you could keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking, that'd be great. Um, I am videoing it, so if you are concerned about that, I just pop, uh, I'll pop my email address in the chat box and you can just let me know. 
we'll be sharing that just internally anyway but i would let you know if that's going to go anywhere external um, so you can use the chat function if you've got questions as we're going along but we will have some question time at the end where we can have more of a general discussion so i will introduce you to who's speaking and what's going to happen so we've got kate schreckenberg who's from the department of geography at king's and uh, we have paul laird who's from the international tree foundation um, we've got Izzy and Naveed Parker Nazir who are going to talk about um, their immersive film that they made and the, the, the tree that they designed. Um, and we've got Jenny Leonard who will be live sketching and there's her hand. Um, so she'll be capturing this visually. So we've got a, a visual representation to take away with us at the end. So that's what will be happening. Uh, we'll have some time, as I said, for, for questions at the end. So just to kick off then, um, I've got just to say welcome to Kate and Paul. And if I could ask you briefly to introduce yourself and then tell us, first of all, some of the benefits of trees. Kate, would you like to go first? OK, thanks, uh, Jane, for organising this. Um, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, the opportunity to talk about trees that's not 100 percent serious. It's not a lecture, but it's, it's just sharing enjoyment. And um, so my work, my research work is very much on management and governance, decision making about how you manage natural resources, but particularly tree resources. So that's both um, how communities might manage a community forest together and how individual farmers might uh, manage trees on their farms um, in a kind of agroforestry system, which we might talk about later. But I, I came to trees because I was interested very early age at school, I wanted to solve the world's food, food problem. So I was thinking about food and you have big ambitions. And um, I didn't fancy the thought of working in greenhouses or working in fields. And so I really got into trees because of the fruit and the food that they provide. So that's my, you know, my first interest in trees and the first benefit that I'll mention, though I did a forestry degree where we were taught all about the timber that trees provide. And that was kind of the main focus of foresters at the time. I think now while timber and all the wood products like paper coming from wood are obviously incredibly important, there's much more of a recognition of the very wide range of benefits that trees can provide. And so, as I said, I'm, you know, I'm particularly interested in the food side of things. And you probably all read about oil palm, which is much maligned, but actually, you know, palm oil is the main vegetable oil that we use and we use a heck of a lot of it and so there are some detrimental effects on other trees because of the planting of, of uh, oil palm for example you know other tree crops that you eat a lot of are um, uh, chocolate from cocoa and coffee and tea all come all come from trees as well as the fruit that you might think of like the apples and the oranges and and uh, and so on so you know very wide variety of food products um, that come from from trees. Um, I've also done a, a fair bit of work with one of my PhD students on firewood, so not timber but all the smaller bits of, of wood that we get from trees uh, and uh, two billion people uh, around the world still depend on firewood as their main source of energy. So you know that's um, nearly a third of uh, the population of the world still uses firewood as their main source of energy and it's very often women that are the ones that have to go out and collect the firewood so it's um working on firewood is, is a way also of addressing women's issues in many uh, in many countries then other things other benefits um from trees well medicines so um if you think about aspirin for example it's based on um salicylic acid which comes from uh, from the bark of willow trees and there are many other um, medicines that come from various trees so one of the, the main treatments for malaria is chloroquine uh, which is also from trees uh, tree bark um, and then obviously we have spices and things like cinnamon and, and nutmeg and so on which are all from trees and possibly have some medicinal um, you know on the kind of cusp between food and, and medicines uh, depending on what you're looking at um, there are also some disbenefits from trees. Um, I had another PhD student who was looking at urban trees in the UK and she did a big survey of all the tree officers around the UK working for councils and their biggest worry about trees 
was the complaints that they get from local people about branches falling down, about shade. Um, yeah, basically sort of health and safety issues around trees were their biggest worries. And that was a bit of a surprise to us because actually they spend most of their time trying to worry about these disbenefits rather than trying to promote the benefits of trees. And, and shade, for example, can be both an incredible benefit you know, if you work in the tropics like I do, then that's one of the things you're looking for is, is that tree that you can go and stand under. Um, but in this country, it can be, um, it can be considered a, a nuisance if it's providing too much shade in, in, uh, over somebody's business or, or uh, preventing people from seeing uh, a business or an advert, for example. So, you know, you have to balance the, the benefits with the disbenefits. But on the whole, I think um, for me, uh, you know, I've really listed a whole load of, of benefits there and maybe I'll hand over to, to Paul to talk about some of the other benefits that the communities that we work with at um, International Tree Foundation really appreciate. Paul, are you there? It just seems to have disappeared. <laughs> So, Paul, are you there? He may have unmuted himself and ended up knocking himself out. Who knows? I mean, knocking himself out of the system. <laughs> um, but I'll. Uh, if you carry on until he joins us. One other benefit to, to mention um, that perhaps might come up in the conversation and, and that's very, you know, very big in the news at the moment is um, is carbon carbon sequestration and. So I don't know how many of you have been uh, following, you know, obviously climate change is such a big issue and, and one of the biggest solutions that's being proffered at the moment is to plant more trees uh, because as they grow, they uh, sequester carbon and so they fix uh, carbon dioxide, which is the greenhouse gas that we worry about primarily, though there are others as well. Um, and that's something that, you know, I hope we can get across with, with this kind of discussion is that trees are much, much more than carbon because there is a, a temptation at the moment for uh, in the press for looking at trees just as a solution to our, our climate change problem and, and forgetting about all the other benefits um, that trees have. Um, so that's, you know, that's one of the, uh, one of my bugbears at the moment is to get that message across that there are lots of other benefits and actually carbon is the is the co-benefit, if you like. Uh, it's not the primary, uh, the primary benefit that we have from, from trees. I don't know, I see that Paul's not there, but I wonder whether, um, Ricardo, would you like to say something? I know you know all about uh, the benefits that, uh, you know, the soil fertility and income benefits that trees provide for, for local communities. Well, uh, I was not going to participate, but thanks, <laughs> Kate. <laughs> I'm Ricardo with International Tree Foundation. Uh, this is my first day actually as program manager for International Tree Foundation. Uh, most of my professional uh, career has been with Sustainable Harvest International. So talking about trees. Uh, for communities, it can mean a lot. Like I have seen schools that the classroom is under the shade of a tree in a rural community in Panama. So they put like the blackboard just on the trunk and everybody's sitting down and learning from, from there because the sun is really, really heavy. Uh, trees as well has to do a lot with water. Um, we, we, we had a lot of projects like covering watersheds and helping um, infiltration and protecting the, the watershed. As well, like trees, when you have big, uh, heavier rain events, like they can provoke a lot of soil erosion. So if you have trees, uh, soil erosion like can be prevented as well. Windbreakers, like when you have a field that you have been just recently plowed, if you have a windbreaker as well, you don't lose uh, soil fertility or the, particular, uh, the, the soil itself. So yeah, from like an agronomy is like you have a lot of uses for trees. However, they have been seen as the enemy for a long time due to mechanization. Uh, people do not like to have trees because tractors cannot operate. So there's a lot of discussions there in, in agronomy about like, how do we include trees in our systems? Because for row crops, you, the shade is not good. And then if you mechanize, then trees create a conflict for combines or tractors or any type of uh, mechanized implement. But that's talking about big scale or medium scale farming. For small scale farmers, trees are a really important component of their systems. 
uh, because they create like a good environment for let's say their chicken or they can like uh, in, in, in case of you have like a vines that like grow, um, grow around trees, they can create a physical structure for it. Um, so trees are part of the system in a small scale farming and they're not seen as a problem, they're seen as a, a fundamental part of it. However, for industrial agriculture, trees are one of the main enemies and that has created a lot of environmental problems as well. Not having trees in your system has uh, led us to a lot of soil erosion, soil degradation around the world. Like most of, of the mechanized farms now they rely on um, external inputs, uh, fertilizers, because the fertility is not there because we have been exploiting it a lot and not having trees is a factor, not just the only factor, but it's one important factor there. Um, so for small scale farmers, I believe like trees are a fundamental component of their systems are really important for it. Food security is another part uh, because you have trees, not just as timber, they give you fruit, they give, uh, give you nutrients that uh, otherwise you won't, you won't get. Um, and families get around it and they enjoy it. You, you can put a swing, you can uh, do a lot of activities and fun activities around, around trees. That's what I put in, in, in the uh, document. But for me, they're beautiful, but as well, they're really useful in a lot of ways as an agronomist or as a father. <laughs> uh, if you have been to the parks with your children, like a tree can save your afternoon. Yeah, that's actually perfect to segue into some of the things that people said, actually, when I asked um, what makes the essence of a tree. Um, and some people wrote strength, wisdom, resilience, patience, life, energy, beauty, renewal, knowing that eventually nature will take everything back. Um, some really lovely things. And if you want to pop anything else in the chat function, that would be nice to capture what, what you feel is an essence of um, a tree. Um, maybe now we can talk about some of the, some of the, the cultural significances of trees and what they mean to us maybe in a, in a different way in terms of um, well-being and um, um, legend and stories and many people shared stories and poems um, and legends of trees that mean something to you so perhaps Kay you could talk a bit about that and then it would be great to have um, Izzy and Navia talk a bit about their, their tree project, which um, was an immersive film called um, Bringing the Outside In to Make Your Own Paper Tree. Um, so if we could maybe go to Kate first and then um, Izzy and Navia, if you can chat a bit, that would be really nice. Well, I think when, when Jane and I started talking about this, you know, it took me back to my childhood. As you can perhaps tell from my name, I'm, I'm German. And so I grew up with lots of German fairy tales, which some of which are extremely well known in, in English as well, from the Brothers Grimm, for example. And there are so many that feature forests and trees. And, and it's astounding because sometimes the forest is a place of refuge for children running away or, or a lost princess or a lost prince or someone. Sometimes there are places where people end up getting very confused and lost and having to find themselves. Uh, sometimes they can also be quite scary um, and dark places. So, you know, they play a really varied role in um, my kind of childhood memories, thinking, thinking about all these stories that uh, my mother read to me when I was a kid. Uh, so I think culturally, you know, trees play a role in, in most cultures. So pretty much any country I've worked in, uh, trees have been very important. So you know, Pardo mentioned schools under, under trees. Well, a lot of the, the villages that I've worked in, in in Malawi, also in Kenya, they have a big tree in the middle of the village, which is the meeting tree. And it's, you know, they don't have a courthouse or a community building, but that's where you go because it provides shade, because it's very large. There's space. People go there to, um, to resolve issues, uh, have meetings, have discussions. And uh, I've always been impressed at, at how much of a role trees play in, in different cultures and I think we haven't been aware of that enough here but it's becoming much clearer how how much we appreciate trees and how important they are for our, our physical and mental health. And we have some a few comments here just before we, we hear from Izzy and Navid um, that 
what the essence of a tree is, protection, grounding, trees are a house for birds. Um, and a comment from Sandra that she's been enjoying admiring trees and, and seeing them coming into bloom, which I definitely have as well, especially during this season of lockdown. Um, Izzy and Naveed, would you like to tell us a little bit about, about the project and why, what, it, what it meant for you? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, I think it was really important for us, the idea that everyone is in lockdown and we live in the cities, we live in South East London um, and we live in a flat and it's the idea that if you can't leave the house, I think it's quite tricky. So it's the idea of being able to appreciate just from looking out of your window, even within the city, there is nature, you know, there's trees on some streets or there's patches of green around. Um, so that was kind of what we were thinking about, wasn't it? Like, how yeah. can we, I think the time for a lot of people, we've been able to slow down a little bit because we've had to be inside. So we're saving, well, for most people, maybe not everyone, you're saving a bit of time so you have a bit more time for reflection, um, which I think can help you kind of re-evaluate um, your environment and what's around you and what, what kind of is therapeutic and what isn't. And I was finding it, because obviously we're in spring, it was quite nice to, to notice, have a bit more time to notice the kind of nature that's around my flat, or our flat, and um, which I probably on a normal day would just like rush to work and not necessarily notice so much. Like I always notice the seasons, but I don't think you necessarily have that much time to really look at them closely. And from an artistic point of view, it's, it was really nice to kind of really look at the details of what was growing and you know we've got a dog so when we took the dog to the garden I was noticing like as the sun <coughs> as the kind of sun was coming over the houses you could tell like the trees were coming into spring and there, there was there were they had buds and shoots and I almost then had like this visual memory each day of things changing which was quite kind of hopeful um, and for me it's what I find really um, therapeutic about trees is that not just like visually it's also the sound as well like when you hear the leaves for me that's really important and um, so I, that's when I started thinking about if we're making a tree for the inside what qualities does it need um, and I like the idea of how if you make the paper tree if you hang it in the window when the light comes from the sun comes through the window it can actually create shadows that look a little bit like um real leaves and it can kind of trick you for a little bit um and also they kind of flutter together so you can hear this if you have the window open you do hear this movement which i think mimics being outside listening to the tree in the wind and how about for you um yeah so for me i think there's a lot of different ways. Uh, I think um, one, of, one of my biggest film, kind of uh, my favourite film director is, uh, is a guy called Terence Malick. Um, I don't know if you're aware of him, but he uses a lot of, um, a lot of imagery surrounding nature in his films. And it's a huge influence for me. You know, I've always loved his use of using nature to, to try and tell a story and um, and a couple of months before this project began, I was reading a book about picture theory. And it's actually really around trying to understand kind of a theoretical framework for how we process imagery. And part of what I was interested in was looking at how we interpret nature. And um, what I found quite interesting was that I think, you know, a lot of people find beauty in nature. And it was talking also about how there's a, a functional aspect to nature as well but as humans we perceive the beauty in it so it's we're basically perceiving the beauty in its function as well and I found that so interesting and um and that's kind of you know for me a big part of you know what I found I've always found that kind of depiction of understanding nature and especially in this director trees and how he uses them in his film a lot of his films can have very typical storylines but they're interspersed with very purposeful shots of nature, uh, rivers flowing, trees, you know, kind of cameras placed low down, looking up at trees, mm -hmm. and really awe inspiring kind of images. Um, so that's really kind of for me what I find 
and I think as well, just really quickly, we we're, we're very lucky to be surrounded by uh, two parks. Mm, yeah. So um, we've got you know two parks kind of ten minutes apart, and also we have just a hill right behind us, which is a bit more wild. And I remember it was only a place I recently started going to with a dog and because it's wild it was like when I came back home I just started to look at my street differently because then you start to realize under all this tarmac yeah, <laughs> this is actually a natural <laughs> landscape and if you look at if you just suddenly look at the outside the shrubbery and the trees and the branches they're, they're just you know to me it's like the urban fox they're just kind of <laughs> you know they're basically growing out all over kind it's of like concrete, it's yeah. not a tightly you know green belt kind of area it's just there, there is nature everywhere so that's kind of interesting to me as well yeah yeah and i think that for us it's also important to make the film not just like a traditional how-to video we wanted to give it a certain mood so it was it would help <coughs> you slow down it would help you, help you consider um and that for us was really important and i think we had a lot of shots didn't we like looking up at things and kind of playing <coughs> with a sense of scale and i think for me that was important to reference the idea that when you're under a tree it's really amazing to look up at yeah. the leaves and feel like a small person you know amongst this huge nature um and i hopefully that can yeah when when we were making across. when we were making the film um we passed this tree every day as we walked the dog and, and that kind of became a reference point for us yeah yeah so sure. we'd always be looking up at up at this tree and and i think for me as well in the film there's a a tree that we feature which is um just literally across it's the sh there's a shot where you're looking out the window mm, yeah. and um and it was important for me to just capture something quite quite natural and it, it doesn't have to be this grandiose perfect huge graceful looking tree yeah. um but it's basically about it's just about in this period you could argue that we have a bit more time to maybe just get off the treadmill and that could make us just be a bit more in the presence with our environment. And I think when you're in the presence, sometimes you start to notice the details a little bit more. So, yeah. I wonder um, if anyone here has made a tree, um, watched the video or um, made a tree. And if you have, could you pop your camera on and show us? Here's mine. Wow. Oh, <laughs> <Amazing. laughs> That's so, That's cool. so good. <laughs> I got almost to the end <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> Almost to the end of stage. Oh wow, cool. I'm waiting for halfway there. I'm afraid I had to go and read out the oven before I managed to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> I found it very, very therapeutic actually when I was when I was watching the video. Um it almost made me just want to fall asleep and not actually do the tree. I was just enjoying the relaxing quality of... Well, my film made you want to fall asleep. <laughs> 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 it's nice. um, it's relaxing. It's nice. Not at all. Oh, Diana, lovely. Um, are there any, are there any, does anyone want to share anything about the tree that they made? Um, or indeed, the people that, that that weren't there at the beginning when I asked what their what their favourite tree was, and why, would anyone like to chip in? I heard um, it wasn't a paper tree, and <laughs> I don't think it looked quite as I was imagining it. But I've heard um, some cut flowers around the flat, and I've always liked these little. So these were freesias, and but just the little sort of bits off the side that just have little buds and um, not necessarily the flowers. I thought they looked a little bit like sort of trees or like branches from a distance, which I don't think I've quite captured that with my little handful. But um, yeah, I just thought they're quite pretty and I quite like trying to place them at least in a sort of tree-like form. Yeah, bring some of the outside in. Anyone else would like to share? A tree. Svetlana, do you have a favourite tree? Oh, <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> yes, actually, the chestnut tree is my favourite tree. And we had some other people, I think, at the beginning. Um, so we had um, birch, silver birch, 
Um, and I don't know if Lyndon is here and he can tell us a bit about the, the New Zealand tree that I couldn't pronounce. Are you there, Lyndon? Sure thing. I just, uh, excuse, hey everybody, I've got my video um, blank because my internet's not, not playing nice today. Yeah, there's a, there's a tree in New Zealand called the Pohu Takawa tree. And it's a beautiful sprawling tree that, that grows with a great breadth. And sometimes the, the trunks will grow kind of horizontally along the beach and then spread out. And it, so it creates this enormous sense of, of, of kind of presence. And then in the middle of summer, it blossoms with just the most like glorious red um, bursts of stamen and the entire tree just turns bright, bright red. And so um, in the Southern Hemisphere, Christmas happens at, um, in the middle of summer. And so these beautiful dark green leaves combined with these bright red stamen has kind of made the Pohutakawa the, the unofficial New Zealand Christmas tree. And so quite often in, in summer, we'll have Christmas and have a meal with family and friends and then just head to the beach or something like that. And so we quite often spend summer days lazing around under the Portakawa tree at the beach. And so for me, it's a tree that just, um, you know, has the cultural significance of, of the season and Christmas and the kind of the broader New Zealand cultural significance of just good time spent at the beach. Um, but it's also um, in a very practical way, really protective because um, the sun in New Zealand is extremely harsh. It's, it's a lot sharper than, than the sun in Europe. So you get sunburnt much, much faster and much more severely. And so um, these trees, because they tend to grow in coastal areas, are a classic source of protection. So you go to the beach and there's actually some really nice shade on the beach that you can lie under. So that is why the Porutakawa tree is my favorite. And I've, let, I've left some pictures in the shared document on Google Drive of, of the tree and its blossom. Yeah. Thank you, Lyndon. Great. Paul, um, we lost you for a while, um, but you're back now. Um, I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit more about the, the International Tree Foundation and um, why you love working with trees. Yeah, hi. Yeah, sorry, I had a few internet problems here. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just say a little bit about how I got involved with trees. I, when I was uh, a young man, I just took off and decided to become a, a sort of tree planter and, and joined the Forestry Commission in, in Scotland and of course ended up in the late 1970s planting lots of, of Sitka spruce trees, which wasn't necessarily what I had uh, really wanted. And um, I remember from that time that um, we, we, were to, um, we were to plant Sitka spruce trees right through some remaining native oak woodlands. This is on the west coast of of Scotland, Ardnamachan, if anybody knows up there, a beautiful place. And, and we as the workers, we, we just decided no. So, I mean, we didn't tell the foresters that we were not going to do this. We just sort of worked our way around this woodland and, and, and secretly preserved it. So uh, the, the workers kind of had a slightly better idea than, me, than the, the so-called foresters. Um, and then a few years later, I got a chance to, to go to Kenya as a volunteer and ended up working with, 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 with the forestry there, but just in a completely, obviously very different world, working with, um, with, with local groups, women groups, churches, uh, schools, um, who, who were keen to plant trees. And I was in a part of Kenya where, where tree planting was very much a part of the culture. Everybody planted trees, everybody had trees. Everybody wanted trees, everybody had little tree nurseries. And it was a whole, a whole different understanding about trees because uh, yeah, everybody had, had trees on their farm uh, and diversity of trees so, so that the the farms looked almost like a forest and, and today, yeah, I, of course, we would call that agroforestry and, and there's all sorts of interesting study of this, but it, it was this learning um, from local people about why they planted trees for, for all sorts of reasons. 
reasons that I had not even really thought about, like um, increasing the organic matter in the soil, improving the soil fertility, um, reducing the wind, making your farm a little bit milder, moderating the temperatures, the shade, increasing the humidity, the crops grow better. And you have all of these different crops and trees growing together. So if one thing doesn't do so well, you've always got another thing and you're getting fruits from the trees and maybe fodder for your cow um, and all sorts of, of, of benefits. And so that, that was a different world for me. And, and, you know, essentially that's what I've tried to carry on doing <laughs> in the next, whatever, 40 years. And that's what led me back to International Tree Foundation, which is very much the, the culture that we have in, in International Tree Foundation, which is about supporting local people um, who want to plant trees or conserve forests and working on a sort of starting assumption that people know their own landscape they know the place they live, they know the kinds of trees that they want. Um, so it's not necessarily for some expert forester to come along and tell them, because actually the motivation is coming from, from those local community groups. And that is, that, you know, for us, is, uh, for me, that experience is, is right across Africa, uh, but also at home here in the UK. And I mean, recently we've been planting trees in Oxford where I live. And um, again, you know, community groups organize and when the tree planting day comes along everybody turns out and you meet a whole bunch of people even in your locality that you would never meet before because people love the idea of planting planting trees and looking after them so that in a word is sort of sort of what we do maybe a little bit uh, idealistically of course it's not always as simple as that but but to me that that's the sort of heart of it yeah and um, there's been a few articles recently about how beneficial tree planting actually is um, if they're not planted properly. Um, would you like to say anything about that? Um, well, yes. Uh, I mean, gosh, people can get very fussy uh, and so on. I mean, one, one thing is clear from what I've said. Um, in, in my view, no, nobody's planting trees to sequester carbon. Or, or if you are, maybe, maybe you're a funny kind of person. Because if you think of planting a tree in your garden or in front of your house, would you plant it to sequester carbon? I mean, to me, that, that's a crazy idea. You would plant it for all the wonderful things that that particular tree um, could, could bring. Um, so generally I would have I would have a lot of confidence in local community groups generally speaking knowing what they want to do um, we, we organized uh, a, a, a sort of small uh, opportunity for, for people around Oxford since we have our office here in Oxford to, to plant trees and community groups applied for that opportunity really just to get a little bit of money to uh, you know to buy the tree seedlings and and, and protective materials for the trees and you know, by and large, their plans were excellent, really good, really sensible. And you know, sensible people also they get advice from you know the local council, the, the, the tree person, and, and and so they don't tend to go too far wrong. Where we went wrong, of course, back in the 1970s, 80s, we planted we planted monocultures of exotic conifers all over the place you know, in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern England, that was, I mean, to me, that was a huge blunder because we, we spoiled landscapes, we spoiled, we detracted from biodiversity and ecosystems instead of enhancing them. We, we detracted from people's enjoyment of, of, of the landscape. So, the, yeah, so there is a wrong way and definitely there's a right tree in the right place, but by and large, local people will, will figure that out the right tree in the right place, I think. Uh, Melissa just shared something there. Um, where's Melissa? Hi, sorry, I'm not on video. Would you like to say a little bit what you just shared there? Yeah, this was something that was, um, I came across on Twitter a few weeks ago now, actually, when the first kind of when lockdown kind of began. And, um, 
subsequently this artist has been found, but it's someone called Rachel Summers who lives in Walthamstow in London. Um, and she began basically writing down the names of the trees in her area with chalk and also her reason why she liked them or a fact about the tree, which kind of lots of celebrities picked up and it kind of went viral on Twitter, but it was just a really nice example of kind of sharing knowledge and a love of appreciation of trees. I thought it was very relevant. Thank you. Has anyone else um, seen any kind of community things pop up or, or even um, been noticing been noticing trees, have a different appreciation of trees. Um, I see someone has um, put in the link there about the, the there's a, several exhibitions that were that were due to happen. I was really excited about looking at trees. Um, and it seems that trees are kind of taking on a new a new significance now. Maybe it's just for me. <laughs> um, and bringing bringing memories back, um, stories back. Um, a few of you shared some of your favourite kind of stories about trees. Um, one that I really liked was uh, the, which I didn't know actually, which is uh, Tolkien's The Two Trees of Valinor. Um, I think Laura shared. Laura, do you want to say a little bit about that? Hi. Yeah, sure. This is, um, Tolkien's just one of my favourite authors and I've been reading some really in that features the kind of two trees uh at the beginning of the world in that kind of angelic um setting and then i think i think it was a it's a really um nice kind of trope i feel like trees a lot uh, a lot are sort of represented in stories with this kind of tree of life and light and giving energy and that kind of things and um in this legend as well they are sort of the first light of the world and that kind of thing and then in um in that legend as well the trees unfortunately get destroyed obviously evil has to reign in the world that's just a thing but also it's uh, it's a lovely story about how um adaptation and sort of the cycle of life goes on and those the flowers of those two trees begin um they transform to become the sun and the moon that we have or that Middle Earth has. So I think that's just quite a lovely story there. Thank you. Does anyone was, else have... Oh, sorry. I was sorry. just going to say quickly to Laura, um, I love that depiction of trees in, I think it's the second one, um, the two towers, I think. And I remember at the, <laughs> at the end, it was the way they catch fire and they're still fighting and stuff. It's, it's incredible. Yes. It's really, really moving. It's very moving. Yeah. Would anyone like to share? I've any, got any one. Story? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Agnieszka. I've got um, my story uh, from Bristol about a community that uh, decided to defend the trees. So there were three uh, maple trees, quite old, and um, it was on a, on a land where a developer came, well, purchased the land, and there the, the were plans to build new developments for um, affordable housing. So one tree was um, cut down, and the community got really upset. And with the remaining two, they have built three houses just to stop the further damage. It was incredible. It was now maybe a month and a half ago, and the house trees are still um, still there. And I saw like loads of people just doing uh, shifts, standing virtually by the trees, and not allowing the developer to come on land. Even it's just they protected the trees, built fences, fenced them off. Uh, and yeah, the two trees were saved thanks to that. So it really makes a difference when people decide that they really want something. So um, it's just really pleased to see that. Uh, I love trees so much and it virtually breaks my heart when any of them gets cut. Um, yeah, so I wanted to say that. Thank you.
Would anyone else like to share a, a favourite legend, story, poem? Um, yeah, I'll um, say about one of my favourite children's books that I always read from when I was about four or five. Um, were all the Brambley Hedge books. I don't know if any of you guys have read them, um, but it's about um, a whole little colony of dormice that live in trees and each family has a different tree. And the pictures in the books were amazing. They were cut through, kind of um, spliced through the trunks and then each section of the tree was a different room and there was a whole different um, kind of uh, hierarchy in the little mouse society and things. And I, I just grew up really thinking that you know, it really set in stone for me how much they are um, a cornerstone of everything in nature and how much life is in them, even if you can't see what's going on inside. Mm. Thank you. Also love Brambley Hedge. You've just made me remember that. They are such good books. 30 years ago. I haven't thought of them at all. And you're saying that. <laughs> absolutely amazing books. I don't know if you still get them. <laughs> but I would recommend them for kids if, if they're still available. And also adults. As well, of course. <laughs> I think a really good book as well is um, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And I, I, I grew up with it, but I think it's older than... My yes, there it is! <laughs> Great book. Um, it's basically how this, like, this tree was there for this child, like this, this child for the entire, his entire life. And it starts off as a little boy and goes until him being an old man needing somewhere to sit. And he sits on the stump of the tree. Spoiler alert, sorry. But <laughs> um, I... I remember that book it's one of the rare books that i remember like really really reading over and over again as a child because it's, it's really easy to read and i think shell silverstein has some really good messages throughout all of his books so nice there's also dr zeus and the truffula trees which is actually a, a really good fable for our times as well you have read that one definitely worth looking at uh, not just if you have kids but also as an adult because it's a the story of cutting down trees just for profit, just for income, and not thinking about the, the environmental consequences and, and the human social consequences. And again, at the end, it's a child that basically saves the day. I think the, the message of hope is there. So we have two tree experts here. Does anyone have any questions? Um, specifically for them. Um, I, I've been reading um, Peter Wollerberg's The Hidden Life of Trees, I'm finding it really fascinating, but quite dense um, in terms of <laughs> biology and um, yeah, the functions of trees. Um, so I have some questions, but I don't necessarily want to talk all the time. So if anyone has any questions or even comments, um, don't be shy. Samantha? Hi there. Um, I had a question for Kate. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, all of your very interesting information. And my question is, you were talking about how you didn't want the press to solely focus on the importance of um, trees and carbon. What would you kind of want the story to be um, about trees at the moment? I think, um, you know, we tend to focus on climate change as being the problem of today. Well, other than COVID, obviously, which is a problem which seems to have knocked pretty much everything else off the, the newspapers uh, entirely. But um, that aside, climate change is this huge issue. But we forget about, uh, you know, biodiversity also being a really important issue and then general inequality in the world and with people's livelihoods and needing to focus more on, on well-being more generally. Um, so, you know, as, as we've all been talking about how, how good trees make us feel, it's not all about just improving income and, and having more, 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 but it's actually thinking about what we need for our, our well-being and, and feeling good. And um, so in terms of trees, I, I think um, several of us have been saying, you know, they, they provide a lot of that. They're, they're all of that in one package <laughs> in a way. Um, so while the excuse at the moment might be to, to plant trees for carbon, it really, you know, I, I worry because people get on the bandwagon, big funders will come along and say, yes, well, you know, we want to offset this much of our carbon emissions. And 
and hence we need to plant this many trees. And the way to plant millions of trees, the easiest way, is to do it at very large scale, the way Paul was describing from you know, the, the 70s and 80s in the, in the UK, when we just kind of blanketed um, some of the highlands with, with six groups, um, you know, not realizing that not what the local landscape should look like. And now there's a much bigger realization, but it's still teeny compared to where the big money is, um, that actually we could just let nature do its thing. Um, you know, you could actually go for rewilding and, and allowing nature look very messy to start off with, but actually it finds its own way. There's a balance between the different organisms and trees will definitely come to the fore in that. Um, and one of the hardest things I think that we find in, in um, when you're trying to support people in planting trees is finding the land to do that. So land tenure is really important. So finding patches of land where you can actually say, yes, we can let this land go wild or we can provide some tree planting if necessary. You know, that that's quite a challenge, I think, to, to get that right. And um, what we do with International Tree Foundation is, is uh, which is a charity that uh, we basically support people who have small plots of land and, and, and try and help them organize themselves to, fight, to agree on a, a plot of land that they can use uh, for trees. And one thing with trees as well is that it is a, it is a long, long-term activity. It's looking to the future. And many people in developing countries plant trees as uh, savings banks for their children, for example. You know, they'll plant a few trees around their house when a child is born. Somebody put that in the, in the chat as well, David, you know, that uh, you had a, a, when your daughter was, was born, a uh, tree was named for her, uh, which is really, really nice. And, and in developing countries, you know, that's very typical that people will plant trees because they know that, you know, by the time the kid needs to go to school or, or something, you'll be able to uh, get a, an income from that tree. Um, so we try and support people to, to find the land, to organize themselves, to agree not just who's going to plant the trees, but who's going to benefit from the trees when they do mature. So that's a really key thing that you don't have um, people who are more powerful sort of saying, oh, I'll give my bit of land. I'll get everybody else in the village to plant the trees. And then when they mature, you know, I'll get the timber. Uh, that can happen. So <laughs> the organizing people well and getting everybody to agree on the purpose um, and how it's going to be managed is, is really an important part of the work, which is why you know, we find if we, if we get people coming to us wanting to offset carbon and, and wanting to pay very small amounts for planting trees, that doesn't really take into consideration the fact that actually you're working with people um, and trying to build their capacity to, to manage a resource in a, a sustainable way for the long term. So, yeah, I guess, sorry, that's a very roundabout way of answering your question, but, you know, the press likes very simple yes no black and white stories it's not a yes no story it's a very nuanced story with trees um, and it's a very deep story as well going down to the roots and if you imagine the roots going you know well double the distance of the crown of a, of a tree um, that's how deep and complicated you can get with with trees and uh, you know one of the things that Jane and I were talking about before before this session as well was was just the new science that we're finding out about trees, that actually trees are a, are a community. You know, we tend to think of them as individual organisms, but more and more, that book that Jane mentioned by Peter Vorleben and other books are, are bringing together the science, which show that trees communicate in all sorts of ways. They're linked through their roots, through the fungal hyphae that go from one tree to another, which transmit ele electric uh, signals. And, and so you've got uh, messages going, you've got uh, nutrients flowing between uh, older trees to younger trees to support them. For example, if a tree gets uh, attacked by insects, it can um, send out pheromones. So that's sort of olfactory molecules, which will attract the predators of those insects and will also warn other trees to start, um, you know, getting on the defensive. So, you know, it seemed very appropriate in this kind of COVID time when we're more isolated, but actually more in a community, in different communities, like, like we are talking to each other now to be talking about trees, which also seem quite uh, individual sometimes when you look at them, but to think about them as a community. Um, and that, that makes you realize that, you know, no community should be uh, miles and miles of identical trees. It, it should be a, a living mixed age, mixed species uh, community. So my idea of tree planting goes in that direction, definitely. 
Thank you. Ricardo, did you want to say something? Yeah, just quickly, like to piggyback a little bit on what Kate is saying. There's a lot of, of risks in just commodifying like carbon in trees. Um, we can end up thinking, oh, I will upset all my footprint and somebody else will get rid of all that carbon that I'm putting. And I'm not assuming like that my consumption is part of the problem. That That's one. And the other one is if you want a really large scale like a tree planting program, most likely it will affect the communities like in, in, in the tropics. And, and that will create more inequality, more risks about climate change. You have a big monoculture, like we're talking about loss of biodiversity. We're talking about taking their land, their access to land, to resources. So the upsetting idea, uh, carbon offsetting idea, like poses a lot of risks at different levels. And let's not just jump on it like, oh, I'm upsetting all this carbon because I gave money to this company to plant eucalyptus or conifers somewhere in the world. Like, I think we have to think about our own consumption patterns, first of all. And second of all, what type of projects are this upsetting like uh, money is going towards? Uh, because if it's going to be a plantation somewhere displacing people, it's creating more problems than solutions. And just think about it when, when you're upsetting your, your carbon, who you are giving the money to. And I think it's important to think about it. And climate change is, is certainly it's an inequality event. Like rural communities are suffering the most, and they are the ones that had the, the lowest like carbon footprint. Uh, so, so let's not keep this pattern. Like oh, let's give money for them, and now I keep polluting as much as I want. And they have risks of droughts, risks of flooding. So they are bearing most of the risks. And just through upsetting, we're not going to solve it. We're going to make it even worse if it, if it is in these kind of schemes. Uh, so at least in the International Tree Foundation, the upsetting is about communities and communities developing their own, their own access to resources and managing their own resources and their trees, uh, not big plantations and, or companies in this, in this sense. Thank you. Just um, we have a question from Svetlana, and then I'm aware of the time, um, and I'd like Jenny to to briefly talk about what she's done. Um, Svetlana, would you like to ask that question? You have your mic off. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I was just um, <clears throat> wondering if there was a connection between um, trees, broadly speaking, and a heritage and cultural heritage, because a lot of the questions that, uh, a lot of the points that seem to be raised here about social social cohesion in some ways, trees, communities, inequalities, all these points connect very uh, sharply with um, several sustainable development goals. And I was uh, wondering the extent to which the tree plays an essential part in, in, the, in the memory of a place, in uh, the, the connection between that place and the community and its sustainability and its cohesion in some ways and it's 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 possibly a very broad question maybe not very related to what you're doing but i was just putting that as a just as a remark it's not it's not for an answer just as a remark. would anyone like to to comment on that Um, maybe I'll just say a word. This is Paul. Um, I mean, I think it's a great question or a great comment because I think that there's a huge heritage about trees. And, and, and one of the things that we, we do observe is, is that uh, often it is the older uh, folks in the community, maybe particularly the older, maybe women in the community who may have the greatest, deepest knowledge of, of the trees um of, of of their landscape and of their culture and, and the traditional uses and values that are associated with those trees and uh, you know there's a huge risk that that uh, the younger generation grows up you know rapidly excluded from that that knowledge and and culture and tradition and, and could lose that that knowledge that know-how within just one generation um and as we lose biodiversity um, and lose um, some of the, the, um, the native indigenous trees of, of our landscape, um, very quickly 
uh, we, we, we lose those threads to um, all sorts of traditional uses of those trees and, and of the biodiversity that was associated with those trees and the values uh, that, that people had for those trees. So I think, I think it's tremendously important. Thank you. Any other comments or questions before I ask Jenny to run through what she's done? Just had a quick question for, um, I think it's uh, Kate. Um, I just wanted to know, um, is the situation in Brazil politically with Bolsonaro and what's going on there, how is that affecting your organization and how does that maybe affect the larger kind of ecosystem of trees because it's such a concentration? Not sure um, we have the space or time to discuss that other than, you know, trees are a hugely political issue. And uh, I think one of the things I mentioned earlier on about um, inequity is, is a big issue. So you have both communities of the kind that ITF works with the International Tree Foundation, though we don't work in Latin America, we, we work um, in Africa but, and, and the UK, but the situation is similar. You have, you know, communities who are very in tune with the forests that they live in, but you also, forests are a land bank, they're seen as a land bank by many developers who want to have large scale agriculture, who want to cut down the timber first of all, which is uh, extremely valuable, uh, both for the domestic and international market. So you have quite a difference of opinions, um, you know, with amongst the people within a country and uh, more globally as well about what kind of trees are valuable and for whom, uh, and whose benefits should actually determine policy. And so I think Bolsonaro is just an example of, of a politician and you get them at different levels, not just national level, but also you know, sub, sub-national level, uh, who's playing to a particular audience. His, you know, his concern is much more with the people who see that, uh, that forest as a, a national land bank that they should be able to used to develop without any consideration for the smaller community, you know, smaller people, <laughs> the, the, the small producers and communities that are and less powerful communities that are living there and also without concern for the global impact that that will have. Um, so, you know, I think um, we face these issues everywhere. It's about prioritizing and prioritizing the, the needs and, and uh, the benefits for everybody rather than, a, and a much wider set of benefits rather than just focusing on again you know they're looking at trees as timber and as um taking up land space where they want to put something different a different land use whether it's chain or, or soya or or uh, cattle thanks kate can i just ask um i, I know ricardo you, you you may want to comment but um i I'm, I'm aware that jenny has to has to dash off i think to another another gig so I wondered if Jenny you would um, I can see lots of stuff that you've drawn then it'd be really nice to see you um, just talk through some of what you've captured. Cool. Hi everyone um, I actually don't have to rush off to a gig now because it got cancelled today I'm <laughs> so I'm all yours. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, yeah sure I can have a little chat about um, what well, if you can bring your uh, guy but um, I guess uh, I can go through just some some themes we started over here. We're talking about um, the uses of trees and what all the beneficial things um, and then sort of working down. I think someone mentioned at the start when people see it as sort of a detrimental thing like fallen branches or shade. And then, you know, the antidote to that being that it's protection. Um, and then they talked a little bit about how to include um, trees in our system, like when we're working in the urban environment. And I really liked, um, I think, what Izzy said. Or, um, sorry, is it your boyfriend? <laughs> um, is it, uh, um, uh, what is under all this tarmac? I thought that was really interesting. Like, yeah, we sort of are detached a bit from nature and forget that like everything's around us and growing underneath. And um, yeah, what is our sort of presence in nature? Um, and these are a few of the buzzwords that people said about what's the essence of a tree. And then I really loved sort of this section up here was when we were talking about forests um, as a place of, and then, You've got all the different things that, you know, as a place of refuge or as a place of confusion. And I was thinking a lot about Disney, uh, 
you know, Disney movie moment. They use trees as a bit of a metaphor for like a scary place or yeah, a romantic place. And lots of these things can sort of come out. Yeah, it's a place where you get lost and stuff and how we sort of still, um, tell stories um, through nature. And then working up here is when we're talking a bit more about the community and culture of tree planting and having it as a savings bank. And then finally, I think what come out to me at the end when you sort of zoom back from it is I think someone at the last minute talks about how trees communicate to each other. And so that's why you've got these sort of dotted lines. I thought that'd be a nice sort of roundup way to connect the whole mad brainstorm that does look a bit of a jigsaw at the moment but once I colour it in on Photoshop it might stand out and we can pull out different things but but I mean this this are really interesting I think like what's under the tarmac I know I just made a note to myself like even even the fabric of this paper came from a tree I work on paper all the time and we're sort of so detached from from nature and we seem to want to like tidy it like I was repotting a money tree the other day and I sort of you know we want to kind of control nature in some way and put it in a neat place and make it in on look pretty onto shelves and yet there's all this like crazy chaos going on underneath and um yeah so that's my little brainstormy feedback but um yeah hopefully Jane will be able to send around a, a color copy of this Jane once I uh, photoshop it up and um and then you'll be able to share it but um it was a really interesting talk thanks everyone i really enjoyed um sketching it's a bit of a new uh, subject matter for me and it's really lovely and visual like to create roots and draw trees and stuff so it's it's much uh, nicer than draw, drawing um, what, some of the stuff i did this week which was all about financial literacy so uh, <laughs> that's a welcomed distraction to be drawing about nature and, and, and all the good stuff in life so thanks very much everyone Thanks, Jenny. It's great. And yeah, I'll share that around um, by email so that you've got that when, when um, we have the final version. Um, and yeah, I encourage you to make your own paper tree. Uh, it, it took me about half an hour. I'm probably quite slow, um, but it was great. Once I'd finished it, I felt a real sense of achievement. Um, and I keep putting it in different places in the house to see what it looks like. Ah, yeah, Izzy's got hers. Um, lovely. <laughs> and if you, uh, yeah, if you want to share that with me, that would be great. Mm. I'm going to be collecting pictures of, of people's trees so that we can have a kind of final collective forest. Um, and I do believe there are prizes to be won. Um, Julia um, has, has some uh, wild seed bombs for anyone um, who, who makes a tree. You'll be, you'll be sent some wildflower seed bombs. So. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you for joining and thanks to our speakers and everyone who contributed um, and yeah I just wish you well and that you would enjoy trees whether they are next to your window or in your memory or in your favourite children's book. Um, yes, thank you everyone. Thanks Jane. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone.